All right, welcome back. Game three at the ballpark. We will be there later today. Doug Glanville, nice enough to join us. ESPN Radio, he'll do the national broadcast with Boog Shambi as they get ready for Diamondbacks and Phillies. This series is over. There's no reason for Doug to even have gotten on a plane to come out here, according to all the <laughs> Philly fans and the Diamondback fans. It's panic in the street. So from a national view, and you're doing a lot of stuff I'll get to in a bit, but Doug, from a national view, when you're sitting in the booth later today at Chase Field, what are you looking for? What do you think you're walking into today? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of curious about the transition for the D-backs and, and just being home. You know, it's a big deal. I mean, you know, obviously we know Philadelphia has developed, uh, you know, an incredible reputation of supporting their team to the point where they're like a 10th man out there. Uh, it is so loud and it's such an X factor. Uh, but the D-backs don't have to deal with that now. You know, they're, they're home. And I'm looking for that reset around. And, uh, you know, and, and with their pitching, we know that after uh, Gallon and Kelly, they've had struggles. Uh, but with Brandon Fott, we'll see, you know, how he's able to kind of get back on track and possibly give him some innings. But their bullpen is going to have to be critical. Um, so I'm just looking at that. I'm looking at the lineup construction, uh, see what kind of reset there is for game three. Uh, and most importantly, you want to kind of get off to a good start because – Phillies hit home runs, you know, first inning. They were just like, the yeah. crowd was in it from the jump. And uh, sometimes you got to, like, get your crowd behind you and do something. Uh, uh, you know, So I'd like to see them do that. And even if it's not the power game, it's by the the stolen base. You know, they were a great base, base running team this year. Uh, they got to find that again. It's interesting. As you and I are sitting here talking, the lineup is not out yet. Torrey did say yesterday that he's going to make some adjustments, what those are. Um, remains to be seen. I was surprised in seeing how sloppy the Diamondbacks were in game two, not knowing how many outs, Gurriel, the, the, the pop-up, the miscommunication. This hasn't looked like the same team that I saw against Milwaukee or the Dodgers. And I'm just wondering, is there something to the the atmosphere in Philadelphia? Yeah, I was there. It was amazing. It was electric. But as a ball player, Doug, do you are you able to tune that stuff out or is this just simply, this is a team, Brad, that is just, it's too big a stage for them at this point. They're too young. They've never experienced this. We've seen some of that. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a combination and it might be individual. I mean, you look at Gabby Moreno and that, that kid has ice water in his veins and Corbin Carroll, really. I mean, you know, they are, they're really good. And Guriel, you mentioned, but he's, he's kind of a veteran player. Um, but yeah, there, there's no question collectively there's a huge factor of these fans in Philly. Um, yes, you're all professionals and they deal with it. Just like in game one, it was kind of like the tale of two cities. In the beginning, they were just getting punched against the ropes. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, okay, Perdomo hit a home run. And then it was like a 5-3 ball game. It was like, oh. And it, you know, you kind of thought they might build on that because they kind of neutralized and figured out how to handle the crowd. But once again, the Phillies came out punching again. And, you know, it just sort of started that spiral because the crowd was in it from, again, Schwarber lead home run. You know, it just kind of keeps going. And, um, and yeah, the mistakes were uncharacteristic. I mean, the outs, I mean, even Carroll, who, what, you know, what an unbelievable player, uh, but he kind of laid back on that ball, hit to right. And then Schwarber took third on him and he took that completely on Corbin Carroll uh, because he kind of waited back a little bit instead of coming through it. And, you know, I felt like, okay, I don't want to overcharge it and make a mistake here. And and that's kind of what the the fans were kind of having that kind of impact. And then when usually you get in that mode, you end up making more mistakes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I think being home is a big deal. Uh, I think it's going to be a relief in some ways. And then they can kind of collect themselves, get into their game. And uh, maybe then the next time they're in Philadelphia, if that's how it turns out, they could, you know, they could kind of tap that experience. Doug Glanville with us for a couple of minutes. He'll do the national broadcast on ESPN Radio later today, game number three throughout the series. There's some other things we'll get to shortly, too, that are interesting to me. Um, I'm just wondering a top-to-bottom view of, of like a kid like Corbin Carroll, or what do you see out of some individuals on the Diamondbacks? Forget about games one and two, just how they're constructing this. This is a 110-loss team two years ago. We've seen a lot of bad baseball here in Arizona through the years, and just the, the fact they're here is amazing to me. I'm just curious, Doug, your view, roster construction players you like, a little bit more about them if you could go in depth. Well, you just start with Corbin Carroll. You start with Gabby Moreno, um, a, a young catcher. That's a hard thing to do because you have to manage everything, staff, and and uh, he looks so calm. I asked him uh, a couple of days ago, I said, well, you know, were you always this calm? <laughs> and he said, no, I had to kind of, I had to have experiences and I had to gain confidence. It was incremental. 
Uh, but then he started to get perspective on it. And, you know, he looks at the best. He watched Miguel Cabrera. And that's how he learned how to go to right field. Uh, he's a student and uh, he's highly respected and he shuts down the running game in a time when the running game is, you know, out, out of control, basically. So, um, so I, you know, I already there, Perdomo, huge upside, great defender, switch hitter, uh, all-star, obviously. Uh, their young players are really incredible and they have a one-two punch on the mound uh, that rivals anyone in the game. So that's a lot to build on. I, I just think their game, though, is defense. It's base running. It's aggression. You know, they have to play that game. You're not really sitting around for the three-run home run. Walker will give you a few, uh, Marte. But generally, your game is much more getting on base. So when I talked to JT Real Muto of the Phillies catcher uh, yesterday, uh, I asked him, I said, well, you know, what do you think? Or, you know, a couple of days ago, I said, well, what do you think um, about you know, what you have to do? He's like, well... With the Diamondbacks, I know they run, so you just have to keep them off base. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, if they get on first, it doesn't matter, right? So, um, you know, so that is the mentality, and and the truth is, the Phillies pitching is executed, and it's it's taken away the Diamondbacks' uh, weapons to really put a lot of pressure on the bases. Let's get into today's game a little bit. Um, the pitching matchup, Suarez fought. What do you see? What are the fans going to expect as they're listening to you, or if they're at the ballpark today? Well, look, Fod is like, you know, trial by fire, man. I mean, he's, you know, he came out of spring training. He was, you know, sent out. He comes back. He's up. He's down. And, um, you know, so he's gotten better each chip away. He's kind of made some adjustments. They set him down with always a purpose. The D-backs always have a plan. So when they set him down, they said, hey, we need you to work on this. Hold runners together. And uh, so he has a plus-plus breaking pitch. I mean, that's the sort of way he gets out. But the other stuff to complement has been the problem, the setup to get to that. Uh, you go back to game, I think it was game one in Milwaukee mm -hmm. uh, when Taylor got to that fastball up and in. He hit the glove, but he was he needed to elevate it a little bit higher, right? So it's just like that pitch to set up the slider, set up the secondary pitches. Uh, that's what I'm looking for from his command of the fastball, more for it to set up the other pitches and set up his strength. And then with Suarez, you know, this guy was amazing against Atlanta. Uh, he gave him four innings. He gave him a lot of, you know, he's got a great sinker. He feels his position well. And he stayed out of the middle of the zone. He That's what's impressed me because he was, he kind of gets into this overthrow mode. And the year before he made a lot of mistakes. This year he's not made a lot of mistakes. So I'm looking for the Diamondbacks to kind of be able to, you know, lay off tough pitches up and in, you know, especially that sinker. He likes to jam you and, and break your bats and, uh, and really make him work. Uh, and uh, because when he's right, it's like sinker curveball, sinker curveball, and then everybody's out in front. Um, so, but you know, Suarez is going to be on the road now, so it's a different ball game. Uh, although Atlanta was, you know, a tough challenge. The D backs, you know, they're, they're just back home, and I'm sure they're going to be happy to be home. If you're building a team and you have the first pick, is Bryce Harper the pick? Uh, well, it depends on what I'm building, right? Is it, is it like I want to win today? Um, because, you know, I, I know Corbin Carroll will be on my short list. I'll tell you that. Hmm. Um, because, you know, you know, this guy did something nobody's ever done. 30 doubles, 10 triples, 25 home runs, 50 stolen bases. He's a great base runner, elite. He's an elite defender. And he's like, he's like ice water in his veins. I mean, that's, that's like a player that you win a lot of championships with. <laughs> so, um, so I would put him on my short list, but yeah, Bryce Harper, certainly for the postseason, and but you know, I'm also thinking he's getting a little older. Everybody's getting older here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Bryce Harper is um, is incredible. Acuna Jr. Uh, there's there's some great players in this game. Mookie Betts. So um, I'd be happy with any of those guys. But Cor Corbin Carroll is the young guy, though. <laughs> That's the guy <laughs> that you can see ten years from now and saying he's still great, amazing. <laughs> and he signed for ten more or nine more years here. That's the amazing part too. They they had a vision yeah. on it. Um, Doug Glanville with us for a couple of minutes, ESPN Radio, who do the national broadcast um, of the game, Diamondbacks and Phillies throughout the series. You do some other things that I'm curious. I like to talk process because there's people that watch what we do and they want to know how you get there. And you played and now you're a part of a lot of different things. ESPN Radio, The Athletic, you do work for Marquee. Um, class is in session, I believe is the name of the show that you do. So how do you put it all together and then get behind the microphone today and do three, four hours and just be so laser focused, Doug? How's that yeah. work? Well, I, I see all that you mentioned is as, as uh, compliments of each other. They compliment 
Um, you know, because I get to do like classes in session or teaching at UConn, I get to kind of dive into the academics. I see what the fans, you know, I, I teach students that are 18 to 22 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I learn a lot from them. And I think, um, you know, presenting the show, uh, I, I dive into like how sports impact larger society. And so nothing better than playoff time. You know, there's the impact, there's economics, there's uh, so it gives me a little well-rounded look at the sport. And I think it supports uh, a lot of the storytelling, a lot of the research that I do for the game. But yeah, I, I have a very strict process. I I dive into all kinds of websites from fan graphs to baseball reference to stat cast. To, uh, I read stories. So I get a lot of information. And some of it is like a safety net. I don't necessarily, I might, you'll see my paper and you'll see like, what Corbin Carroll's hitting against lefties on Thursdays in a winter <laughs> storm, you know, but I don't go to that often. I, it's just sort of just in case. I want to just contextualize. In have, it. Just in case you have a ten nothing game, like, yeah, ten nothing game, or yeah. or Shambi who loves to get in the weeds. You know, I I have stuff for him too, um, but yeah, so I I love it. I like the research and um and most important, the best research is the pregame, um, talking to the players. You know, at batting practice, talking to the managers and the meetings and interview guys, and um, that's you know that's the best stuff because that's like what's happening now. That's how they feel about things. I you know I get so much good stuff from uh from the players and and talking to him. my spanish is really good so i interviewed you know gabby moreno i talked to him for a while and, and it's it's i think that's the, a little bit of the lost story because you have spanish-speaking players yep. that are every bit as important to this team and they you know hear from them a lot because it's you know it's translator and all these things um and i don't think it's like fair to their contribution so i really go out of my way to try to talk to players and use my spanish no matter how bad or good it is just to get you know more information from guys uh, and it's fun. I've, you know, I learned about like Jose Alvarado's chains and all kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so I, I dive in and, um, it's something I really love to do. I love the game. I still love the game and being around it still after the, the postseason, after my post career, uh, is, is still nothing short of a gift. And, um, so, um, yeah, so I, and, I, and plus I'm trying to, you know, frame history. Sometimes you're facing history and you want to be able to do it justice. And um, so I think preparation is a big part of that. Sometimes I'll talk to players when they transition uh, out of the game on the field and they go into broadcast and then the itch hits of, I want to be a manager or I want to be a hitting coach. Or, I want to get back and put a uniform on. Have you had that itch? Not really. Um, you know, I, I did interview for the Rays job uh, when, when Kevin Cash got hired, I think it was like 2014 or somewhere in there. And my, my wife was like, this is an academic exercise, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I learned a lot. It was it was fun. Um, I, you know, and I talked to people and I, I've been flattered with a lot of different opportunities from organizations, uh, you know, over the many, many years of being out of the game. Uh, and, and it's not like I foreclose it, you know, but I think timing wise, I have four kids, you know, a seven year old. Uh, and I'm already on the road as it is and doing yeah. what I'm doing. So I'd have to kind of really be specific. Uh, one of the passions I do have for being working for a team, let's say, or working front, you know, in the, you know, not so front office, but the league or something like that is like my class. You know, I, I'm, I'm always talking to players about the impact on sport, on larger society. And I think when we've gone through a lot of things, you know, nationally, whether George Floyd or all these things, I think it's good to have resources around to support players, to be able to get more informed about the issues, to be able to have like, constructive but like respectful dialogue around everything make change if that's what you want to do uh i'm very interested in like the 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 social impact of, of players in a way that capitalize on the fact that that sports at its best you're really bringing people together you're teaching unity as a player you're learning about all these cultures and coming together as one um you have equity at the center of of sport because you have to have rules that are fair that's why we were so outraged by sign stealing and steroids and I think those are great examples for our larger society to to tap into. Uh, so that's the part I'd love to bring back to a team or a uh, or the sport or or be at a league, and um, and really uh, hone in on that. It's interesting you bring that up. I've taught at Cronkite, and I still remember being the young twenty. I think I was twenty two year old, and they mm -hmm. hand me a piece of paper: Magic Johnson HIV mm -hmm. positive, uh, Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. Um, we're at war yeah. in Afghanistan and, you know, it, it does, you know, 9-11, obviously, 
Um, yeah. All those years, and then you stand in front of a bunch of, as you put it, 18 to 21, 22 year olds, and you talk about, look, you have to know more than just batting averages and, and you know, completion ratios and football, whatever. This is more than just the game itself. Well, it's important. And, and, and by the way, it's unavoidable. I think that's the thing, like, you know, you try to be in this bubble and, and yeah, you, you kind of focus and it's a self-centered kind of world a little bit when it comes to like, you know, your craft when you're playing 162 games, but it, it literally comes to your doorstep. Um, and, and it's like, and why not be informed about it? You know, whether you're going to take a stand or, or whatever you're going to do is one thing. It's another thing just to kind of, you know, be patiently informed. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, because everybody's coming from all these different backgrounds as team, you know, politically, nationally, culturally. And so how do you do you come together? Well, you have to have a certain level of respect for, you know, the fact that not only of the game of your role and everybody's job, but it's also just like where people are coming from. I see it as an opportunity to learn a lot and and learn in an environment where you already know that you have so much in common. Uh, and that's what I love about sports. You could disagree politically, all these things, but it's something to be said when you're both wearing Diamondbacks jerseys and you're like, oh, okay, there's something we could actually start off on on a baseline that we agree on or that we share a passion for. It already gives you common ground. Uh, that's what I love about sports. And and so I think there's that opportunity uh, where players you know, are stewards of the game. They are uh, looked to in many ways to set examples. And, uh, and I think the the more we can give them a chance to see that, oh, by the way, sports has always had this incredible history of impacting society in, in so many different respects. Jackie Robinson, you, I mean, you go on the list. Muhammad um, Ali. Pa- yeah, yeah. Ali, there's pioneers everywhere. Sure. And we're, we're living with pioneers, you know, Sarah Langs and Jessica Mendoza and everything. So I, I think it's a beautiful thing because why wouldn't you want something that you love, your sport, to actually set a great example for our kids and for for our society, that's a great thing about how to solve problems, how to work together, um, how to be unified, um, you know, and you know, and, and it's a celebration. But yes, it's also it's flawed, of course. You're gonna, you know, sports. It's, it, that's that's actually something to talk about. <laughs> it's the fact that you know, yeah, they're gonna have teams that you know you have problems in like whatever in in soccer in England or whatever it is, and and you have challenges. But that's exactly why you you talk more about it and you. You share that. So it's a, and my class has taught me so much just by my research about, wow, sports have really changed the world many times over, which is a cool thing to think about. All right. The Diamondbacks, stick a fork in them. I'll get you out of here on this one. Stick a fork in them. <laughs> no, I don't count anybody out. Not, right. and, and, and here's all I have to do. They swept the 101 win Dodgers. They just wiped them out. I mean, that's the same team. So if they, they get that and all of a sudden – Schwarber, instead of hitting it over the fence, it pops that ball up. I mean, it's a different game. So I don't count anybody out. Um, you know, they they lost big, but that's just one loss. So they're home now. Uh, you know, try to win one at a time. That's all you do. Appreciate your time and your insights. Good to go deep and in the weeds, as you like to say. And I'll see you at the ballpark <laughs> later today, Doug. Thanks. Okay, Brian. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Doug Glanville, you'll find him on ESPN Radio today doing the game, the national broadcast. And, of course, you can see him over on Marquee. Class is in session. He does work, the Starkville podcast at The Athletic and much, much more. And we're back with more after this timeout.